Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Hello team, welcome to Comic Commentary, tie-in issues 24 and 25. In this series, we'll be reviewing the Young Justice tie-in comics that folded directly into the story arcs of the animated series. My name's Rich, and I'm here with my amazing co-host, Emily. Hi, everybody. In Comics Commentary, we will be discussing how the tie-in comics relate to the video game, the first two seasons of Young Justice, and the broader DC universe. Unlike our regular review episodes, though, we won't be having a Crashing the Mode segment, so consider this your spoiler warning. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on our website, crashingthemode.com, on theyjfiles.tumblr.com, and at our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it back to Emily for... Hello, Megan! This week we are talking about issues 24 and 25. Uh, This final arc, as always, is titled Players, and the individual issues were... Milburn, Edgar, and Jake, and uh, rolling doubles. I I don't even get that. I I did some I t- I did some research on the YJ Wiki, who answered my question of what does that mean? Those are apparently the names, the official quotation mark uh, names of all of the like human characters on the Monopoly board. Oh, can't remember which ones are which, but right. like gotcha. The Monopoly man, the jailer, and the prisoner. All have an official name, apparently, and that's what they are. Alrighty. (laughs) You get you get a board game lesson today, folks. (laughs) The issue release dates were January twenty third and February twentieth of two thousand thirteen for our last issues. Uh, and the timestamps in universe were December first of Team Year Zero and Team Year Five, and our very last scene of this issue takes place on December second of Team Year Five. Just by a couple of minutes after midnight. Mm-hmm. The episode tie-in is that the main plot takes place about a month before the start of season two, while the subplots take place between agendas and insecurity. The uh, writer for this uh, arc was Greg Weissman, the penciler Christopher Jones, inker Christopher Jones, uh, colors Zach Atkinson, who has been the colorist, I think, for the entire run, and the letter Wes Abbott. Just in time for your next mission. So our establishing shot for these last couple of issues is that we open with Deadshot firing a rocket launcher at President Harjafti in Team Year Zero. Chaos ensues. Superman flies in to stop the rocket. Miss Martian flies off to stop the shooter. And Superboy puts on one of his shields to amp up his powers. We then flash forward to Team Year 5, where Beast Boy and Bumblebee investigate the source of the force field that has encircled Metropolis and Batgirl fights Match. Slash Bizarro. Slash Bizarro. Right. Whatever his name is. Whatever it is. Up in space, the Bioship catches up with Killstar's ship, and Miss Martian infiltrates with her density shifting, while the League finally decides to work as a team to take down the alien. Back on Earth, Alpha Squad is stealthing through the Collector's ship with the help of Zatanna's glamour, and they come across a room filled with shrunken versions of intergalactic cities, Nightwing realizes what the Collector must be doing to Metropolis, and a quick cut to Plastic Man confirms that the alien is in fact slowly shrinking Metropolis. Inside the slowly shrinking force field, Batgirl is holding her own against Match, but barely. Uh, She takes him down, but gets knocked out in the process, and while she's unconscious, a LexCorp van arrives to retrieve the clone. And just takes it away, and there's no one who can stop him. (laughs) So they get away with it, and we don't know where he is anymore. Up in space, our captured heroes take on Killstar and seem to beat him until he creates a new inhibitor frequency like the one we saw back in issue 21, I think it was. Yes. We reviewed a lot today. We did. And it incapacitates all of them, and their earlier trick does not work. And back in Metropolis, Zatanna's glamour is dispelled as the Collector discovers and attacks Alpha Squad in his spaceship. Our final issue opens with a game of spin the bottle. (laughs) That whole sentence (laughs) is hilarious. Where Dick Grayson gets chosen by a a mystery girl. The camera angle is actually uh, us from this mystery girl's perspective. We then cut back to the main action of in Team Year 5, where all of our heroes seem to be down for the count. 
until McGann uh, rushes in to save the group, battling Killstar and Blue Beetle steps in to help Alpha Squad. Killstar is impressed by the League and decides to free all of the superhuman quote-unquote weapons he captured from around the galaxy, explaining that he needs help to free his enslaved homeworld and now realizes that sentient weapons deserve freedom too. Today's morality, Uh the wheel of morality, turn, turn, turn. What are we living today? Like, aw, but also, um... (laughs) Um, yeah. Like, you learned your lesson, but only kind of. Good job. Good job moving one step away from completely awful. Yep. Uh, Killstar agrees to return them all to their respective planets, but a few superhumans, mainly villains, uh, agree to stick around and help him fight the people who destroyed his planet. You know, teamwork. The League and several familiar villains return to Metropolis uh, just in time to take out the Collector of Worlds, Brainiac, whatever name he's going by. We then cut back to the assassination attempt in Team Year Zero, where the bullet intended for President Harjafti hits his brother instead. Superboy, under the influence of the shield patch that he's wearing, attacks Deadshot and is only stopped by Superman dragging him off, the beaten villain. Yeah. Yeah. Deadshot's totally normal guy, too, like normal human guy. Like being beaten by an enraged half Kryptonian just doesn't sound good. Yeah, it's not great. (laughs) It may be why we didn't see Deadshot in the rest of the series. (laughs) Back in Team Year 5, it seems like the Collector has been defeated, only for 16 more copies of him to appear out of the floor. The Did you count them? Were there actually 16? Yep, I counted them. Of course there were 16. The Collector reveals that if the force field is deactivated while the shrinking beam is still engaged, it will destroy the Earth, not just the city. Because of this, Brainiac agrees to stop the collection process and to return Metropolis to its proper size. He tells the League that they're risking the preservation of Earth's culture, but still agrees to leave the Earth untouched. We then cut back to Team Year Zero again, where Queen Bee reveals that the assassination attempt was always meant to fail and cement Harjafti's brother, Suman, who is under her mind control, as a hero for the people. But as revenge for Miss Martian and the team's previous actions, Queen Bee uses her powers to influence Marie Logan to drive herself off of a cliff to her death. I had to do that one twice, because I, it hurts. <laughs> it does. It is an emotionally painful scene. Ugh. Okay. Oh, Beast Boy. But, yeah, poor Beast Boy. Poor Miss Martian. Poor everyone. I feel bad for their whole little adopted family. Okay. Uh, not quite done yet. <laughs> not done yet. We can't end on that. That would be too horrible. Uh, Because back in Metropolis, Queen Bee replaces both President Harjafti's daughter and Bippo uh, with Grolade and Imposters, which we see again in season two. At least we see Bibbos. I'm not sure if we ever. I was going to go back and watch that scene. Situation. Yeah, I'm curious now. She might have been in that cage with the uh, secretary from the UN and Bibbo when they found them in episode one. Uh, she may have been in the background. We'll have to take a look and see. Because if she's in there in the same outfit and all that kind of stuff, that would be fascinating. That would be fascinating. Uh, and the team is completely unaware of all that uh, until season two, of course. Uh, but we, in the wake of both attacks, the team and league discuss how strange it is that two different aliens attacked Earth at once, but can't come up with any answers as to what might have caused the influx of invasion. You know, just 16 just hours. What did we do? Uh, and Blue Beetle agrees to join the team, who we will then see in season two as the yeah, the newest freshman. We then cut back to that spin the bottle game in Team Year Zero, because that is an <laughs> essential narrative happening here, where a very determined Barbara Gordon kisses a very confused Dick Grayson for the first time as a result of this game because it turns out future Batgirl is the mystery girl who being good at everything got Dick Grayson (laughs) as part of Spin the Bottle. Uh, And for our final scene, we cut back to Team Year 5 where Dick returns to his Bloodhaven apartment to find Barbara waiting for him on his doorstep. Uh, They kiss, and although Barbara insists that he's not ready for a real relationship with her yet, uh, she agrees to spend the night with him, and since it's his birthday, after all, they have a cute little moment. 
hashtag never the end because that's how they ended the comic series and it makes me cry. While you were reading that, you blew my mind <laughs> because I just... <laughs> She sp- Bar- she spun the bottle. Yep, because that's how spin the bottle works. She's good at everything. Yep. Y- she purposefully spun the bottle in a way that would make it land on Dick. That's what you're telling me. I like to think that because it's the best explanation for that scene. That, I, that is a hundred percent my head cannon. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yep, I love it. You're welcome. Thank this you. This is why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm feeling some Aster. Let's feel more Aster. Let's do it. Same. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. Okay. So uh, for feeling the Aster, I'm starting with that I think that it's super cute that when asked about being on the team, uh, Zatanna says that she was on the team back when Nightwing was Robin. Like uh-huh. she doesn't say, yeah, when I was a kid, I was on the team. She's like, yeah, when Nightwing was Robin, I was on the team. It's just cute. Right. I like that she connects their relationship <laughs> to her time on the team. The fact that Jaime is like blown away by the idea that there's two Robins. And I was a little yeah. bit surprised that I didn't see someone with a reaction like, wait, there's two Robins. And then somebody thinking like, well, there was three, but one's dead. <laughs> you know, like I'm surprised. It would have been a bit too much. I think somebody said something That's about That's where like, they're going to draw the line in this episode? Like in this whole six issue arc. Yes, Rich, that's where we draw the line. Right. No jokes about Jason Todd. <laughs> no Jason Todd jokes. Okay, sorry, my bad. I I was at a convention once where somebody in a in like a stage show made a joke about Jason Todd and half the audience like was like <gasps> Like booed, and he was like, "Guys, it's, it's been, been what, like thirty years? <laughs> right. How long has it been? Can we talk about it yet?" Right. So apparently, it's always too early for Jason. <laughs> apparently, Tom Jones. apparently. But I do love, I love Blue Beetle's reaction, and I feel like I may be remembering wrong, but I think somebody says like, "Just wait, just wait till you find out that there's a lot." Yeah, like, maybe. I'll somebody says something. I just don't think it's a direct reference to Jason. I also that same scene also has Zatanna saying that her dad is retired quote unquote right and it is heartbreaking and again you can just tell that they really wanted to do a dr fate arc and never had a chance yeah maybe we'll get it please some other way <laughs> please we things could. i want it's, from young Justice. it's possible always more zatanna I also really love in this that we see Batgirl was able to go toe to toe with match for nearly an hour right and that's just impressive in and of itself <laughs> And I love, it's the thing that you see with female characters all the time. It's just a gut instinct of like, oh, okay, so the female character, she's going to do really well, but then she'll get knocked out and somebody else will come in and save the day or whatever. And then she's like, I'm ending this or whatever. And she goes in and there's a smoke bomb and then like she gets thrown out and hits the hits the horse field wall and gets knocked unconscious. And I was like, oh, really? And then Match comes out and he's got the cloak around his face. And I'm like, well, that's not going to do much. And he tears it off. And then you see, like, they've got that that hardened concrete polyfoam yeah. thing, like, all over his face. And he has to breathe. And so he passes out because he goes unconscious yeah. before he can tear it off. And I was just like, I love it. I love it. I love there's so much. There, there's a fight against this TV standard trope inertia of the female heroes just not quite being good enough. Like, they're really good at certain things under certain circumstances, yeah. under certain no, forget that garbage. Like, yes. Beckerl's the best. Let her be the best, right? Barbara, good at everything, Gordon. <laughs> right, exactly. And I like, and but it's also framed as like, she's still human. Like, there will come a point right. where she can't go toe to toe with Match anymore. Right. But it's not framed as like, she's a weak girl. Let's knock her out. It's like, Barbara is human. Right. But she's really smart and figure out a way she's like, He's going to take me down eventually. I need a contingency plan and comes up with something that's perfect. If it was Batman or Dick, they would have figured it out and no one would have thought twice about it. Yeah. You know? So anyway. Going to one of the flashbacks that we see, that scene with Superboy and Deadshot is a lot. (laughs) And we said that, but there's so much great little character stuff happening in that where in the middle of that, there is an exchange between Superman and Connor where... Superboy, while still punching Deadshot into submission, says he's a killer. He deserves what he gets, to which Superman says, 
that's not how we do things. And I don't think it is at all a coincidence that these two lines are spoken off panel, like we don't see Superman and Connor, we just see the word balloons over art that focuses on McGann looking shocked at this scene, because this is a direct parallel to the conversation that she has with Connor in season two, and I don't think it's an accident. Interesting. Yeah. (laughs) Just throwing that out there, because it hurt my heart a little bit reading it this time as the first time that I noticed that because I'd seen that line get thrown around and I was like where is that line from right. I can't even remember and then I came across it rereading these and was like oh also in that same scene uh after Superman has pulled a raging half Kryptonian off of a normal human man who needs to go to the hospital immediately. McGann tells Superman he's not usually like this. I mean, he used to be, but recently he's been much better. And it's precious and heartbreaking all at once because it acknowledges Connor's growth over the entire first season. It acknowledges McGann's ability to recognize that Connor was not always a relatively stable teenage boy and that there was a time when he was a rage monster (laughs) on some level. Right. And the fact that she's really trying to get Superman to see the real Connor and is trying her best to be like, no, no, he's not what you think he is. She is trying to be like, "Let, let me show you who he is when he's not what you think he is. Right. And it's heartbreaking that in Superman's like one attempt that we see to be like, I want to get to know the real Connor. He ends up interacting. Yeah. With... In not a good way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's uh, heartbreaking. And then there's the whole scene between Queen Bee and Marie Logan, which is also super heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah. You uncovered. Uh, we, we should put this link in the show notes, too, because I we think should. it's I think it's important to talk, talk about this scene because this is this is not the original art. Yes. So the breakdown of this and uh, to people wondering, we'll include the link to Christopher Jones's website where he talks a bit more about what went down with this, with this scene of Queen Bee and Marie Logan. In the original script and the original art that they drew for this scene, Greg Weissman and this, the creative team in general had decided that Queen Bee's powers work by her kissing the person that she is mind controlling and this had been like their decision of how they wanted to do this they wrote the script they submitted the script it went through they started the art did all of the art for this and once christopher jones had like finished the full line art they got uh dc comics didn't let them do it dc comics would not let them show queen bee and marie logan kissing and that was their choice, and they can have whatever reasons they want for that, but they wouldn't let it go to print with that particular panel. And the solution from Greg Weissman and Christopher Jones and the whole group was that they decided to change their interpretation of Queen Bee's powers and instead change the visual cue for it to the code language that they used in Gargoyles for Kissing, which Greg Weissman's other a fantastic animated show, which was people touching each other's hair, which was stroking someone's hair. Uh, And so that panel got changed, that singular panel on the page that is Marie Logan and Queen Bee got changed. And a couple of pages later, there is a similar shot where she strokes the hair of, I think it's President Herjofti's brother, I believe is the one who's under her mind control. Right. And she does the exact same thing. And in the original art, that had also been a kiss. Right. And basically DC Comics had told them that they had to change the kiss between Queen Bee and Marie Logan, but didn't have to change the kiss between uh, Queen Bee and the uh, the male person under her mind control. And their solution was, okay, if we have to change one, we're changing both. Yeah. And we're making it consistent and we're not, we're not dealing with the nonsense here. Right. And I think it is both kind of a fascinating look at how these things happen in the comics and how things came to be as well as the way that the creative team handled something that it's not not great <laughs> that this was how it had yeah. to be handled but i think they came up with a really good solution i appreciate that solution and as well we'll include the link to Chris- christopher jones's uh, blog post about it there's another link that we're going to put in too and i'm glad that you found it because i actually went looking for it and i couldn't i couldn't find it i have magic i have magic tumblr powers yeah, apparently yeah, I couldn't find it. Yeah, it's it's hilarious. 
So the whole spin the bottle scene is super cute, uh, even if it did break my chalant shipper heart a bit. <laughs> Because this means that Zatanna isn't his first kiss. And, like, that matters, guys. <laughs> like, <laughs> that the number of fans, myself included, who were, like, kind of annoyed about that online were like, <gasps> Zatanna isn't his first kiss anymore. You've stolen this from us. Like, in that way that only we as shippers can react to something. Okay. Still, super cute scene. <laughs> like, grand scheme of things, doesn't matter. When you are when you are a fourteen year old oh. reacting to a comic, it matters. But I, with the spin the bottle scene, I do love the kind of the narrative contrast between little Barbara's extreme crush on night on not Nightwing on Dick Grayson, who is just this completely oblivious fourteen year old, who when she kisses him, he literally responds with like, "Why did you do that?" <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> like he has no idea and then contrasting that to the much more nuanced <laughs> adult dynamic that they have at the end of this issue it's just kind of wonderful i love that little contrast that we get to see not their evolution but at least the change in that dynamic yeah but the thing that rich is excited about because of my <laughs> magic tumbler powers <laughs> is that there was an early draft of <laughs> of the scene between Dick Grayson and Barbara in uh, the closet where they have their kiss, where all of the board games in the background were ship names from the fandom, right. which was a little thing that Christopher Jones wanted to include as kind of just a little nod and salute to the fandom. Mm-hmm. And DC didn't want to let that go through for reasons that I can completely understand. Like you didn't want to get into issues with that and whatever and I can understand why they didn't let it happen and why they changed all of it, but I would have loved this so much. Uh, but there is this art is online, and Christopher Jones has shared it online, so we will include the link to that too, where you can see that in the background there's just games called like Super Martian right. and Spitfire and Frostbite and Chalant. And they're and, but they're all like not all of them are canon. Blue Pulse is in there, nope. Flash Spell is in there, Neverland I see, and I think that might have been part of why part of why it didn't get to go through of like the acknowledgement of non-canon ships might have gotten into some iffy territory and i understand weren't we just talking about wonder beetle wonder beetles on here too we were just talking about (laughs) wonder beetle the other day i love it we got we love you christopher jones we do i love it and i love all the little like 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 they have little symbols there's bird bird flash uh, there's there's Shazam spelled backwards. That's right. There's Shazam spelled backwards, which is always fun. Right. And then in the middle of all of it, there's Monopoly Gotham City Edition. <laughs> right. The only like actual game. The only like real game. <laughs> but yeah, it's wonderful. Check it out. I love it. And all of that brings us to the final page of this issue, which various random things to say about this final page. One of them that isn't related to either of the other points being that if you look super closely, there's a telephone pole in like the foreground of one panel. And if you look stupidly close at it, uh, and I only knew this because like YJ Wiki did something about it on Twitter, is that one of the missing person posters on the telephone pole in that scene is of Stephanie Brown. Uh Uh-huh. If you look super duper closely, you know, leading into season two where she is unnamed in the show but named in the credits as one of the people abducted by uh the the alien invasion going on yeah so you know just little easter egg hint there it's kind of out of focusy almost like sort of it kind of looks like steph and then it kind of says steph brown but it's hard to make out like you really have to want it yeah. But it's de- it's definitely clearly that. It's not like you Yeah. It's not like it's, you know, a Rorschach test where you're pretending it is. No, it's Maybe it's Steph Brown, maybe it's Cassandra Kane, who knows. It's clearly Steph when you are looking at it, yes. but yeah. Yeah, interesting. And other thing about this final page cuz I know this page annoyed some people. Annoyed a decent number of people for various reasons, whether or not it was people just not shipping dick and barbara which i understand or people being like why are they being treated as like the final page final ship when they have no romantic interactions on the show which is a fair point if they want to have them be the kind of final canon couple on i say final but if 
they want to explore their relationship more on the show. I want more of it on the show in like a way that acknowledges what they might have. Like, I don't want them to just be together because everybody's like, well, Nightwing and Batgirl are together. I'm like, well, you need to tell me why in this universe they should be together Mm. because you know what I mean. But with all of those things, some people were annoyed by this for all of those reasons. But a lot of people are annoyed by this final page because so much of these couple of issues (laughs) revolves around uh, Dick Grayson's love life and the many women in his love life. Uh, And people felt like it felt a little dis... uh, disingenuous or people felt like dick grayson was being a dog considering the number of people who call him that in the show and comics mostly just wally it's not even the number of people it's the two most important people in his life to me yeah so aside from zatanna and i think you make some good points barbara and wally both calling him that like i don't know if they are joking with him but the way that it's presented to the audience is that it's not good. It's not good. And I don't I don't like that uh, about Dick because I think it takes a it takes a character who I love and appreciate because of the fact that he lo- so much has so much emotion and love and care and protective nature to him different than Batman and makes him sound inconsiderate or selfish when he is exactly the opposite of that in every other kind of interaction. And I know Greg Weissman has fielded some questions about this cuz some people have like gone to him when he had his ask greg site where people could send in questions being like what's up with this why does dick grayson have so many ex-girlfriends and stuff and like greg has confirmed that in the young justice universe and their understanding of the young justice universe nightwing has never cheated on anyone yep. when he has been in like a solitary monogamous yep. relationship he wouldn't do that that is not something they have as part of his character he just happens to have dated at least Three women, four women, something around those lines, at least. And we don't know the extent of any of those relationships. And I have, as I said before, talked about this on Twitter a bit when people ask me because people send me shipping questions. Like, there is no reason to assume that, like, he was in a very long committed relationship with Rocket and then things broke off. It could have been that they literally dated for a week and then were like, eh, this doesn't work. We'll still be friends. It's fine. And moved on. Right. But. People make assumptions and everything, but I think the biggest thing to remember with this and why I personally don't consider Dick Grayson a womanizer or anything on this show is that he doesn't chase after women. The the show never presents him as somebody who's like acting like Wally in season one, who's just going after any woman who looks in his direction. It's just that women happen to approach him and he is open to having relationships with them. And I think one of the very important things to remember with this final page is that Barbara is there when Zatanna kisses him. Barbara is not unaware of like the main thing that happens there. They even have like a panel of Barbara smiling at it. Like she's happy about it almost. Like she's like, she's like, it's it's a nice little like in between various emotions panel of like, oh, she's happy for him or she's just kind of like rolling her eyes like, of course, as always, would assume this would happen kind of thing. Right. And I think it shows that like Barbara is OK with it. And Barbara saying you're not ready for a relationship with me does not necessarily mean that that's true of Dick Grayson. That just means that's true of how she views him. Right. Because I think I feel like I have read somewhere talking about this that they have said that Dick Grayson would absolutely in the Young Justice continuity if Barbara was open to having like a committed relationship. Yeah. He would drop everything and be 100% on board with that. Yeah. She just assumes that he isn't and thus acts the way that she does. But she is making her own choices on that last panel and is fully informed in what she is deciding to do here. Right. She is. So, they all have agency. All, everyone yeah. involved has agency and isn't being manipulated. And I think these are the most important aspects of that and yeah. I, I agree with you and I'm, I'm glad that I'm not I know you and I talked about this pretty early on uh, <laughs> when we were having our discussions I think I even just blatantly asked you like so what's your yeah. opinion about Dick's situation you know and so Dick and his many ex-girlfriends yeah 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 I like, like I mentioned in a previous episode I will um, uh, for this episode I will try and time posting up my little my, my short comments about it as well because it, it echoes what Emily's saying and I think the most important part here is is making sure that everyone is uh, aware informed and has agency in the choices that they make and I think that that's pretty key and understanding who Dick is and at his core and what he's about you know so 
yeah with that with that whole scene like i i'm probably repeating myself now but i think the only problem i have with that final scene is the presentation of like batgirl as nightwing's one true love quotation marks on that type of situation with very little buildup like the only real buildup we get for their romance Mm -hmm. is in these six issues so if they want to take that into the show and into season three i'd want more of that more of an exploration of their dynamic beyond just being superheroes yeah it's definitely it's definitely another one of those things where it's like the difference between like all this whole thing was like yep that track all of this tracks 100 yeah. percent. but because i have a very decades long history of dick and barbara yeah and it's like it's one of those things that i'm willing to accept i just want more sure but your point is valid like within the context of the show within the context of the comic yeah like within the context of this, it may feel like it's coming out of nowhere. There's a difference between having something introduced and making you curious about what yes. else there is. You know, like, oh, who is this Peacemaker character that gets mentioned? <laughs> is like, okay, well, maybe I'll go look up who that character is. That's different than, well, wait, wait a minute. You know, this relationship from the comic. Like, it's like if like Starfire or somebody had shown up at the very end and you're just like, where is, what, where's this alien coming <laughs> from? Right? Like, it still needs to make sense within the context. And and for me, it, it works perfectly, but I can see that perspective yeah. of, of what you're talking about with relatively newer watchers or people who are just getting introduced to the DC universe with this, which happens with a lot of people, which is fantastic. It's I, I completely believe it in universe and believe it could work. I just want more is my thing. Um, so my stuff is less deep on some levels. I already went into my deep plastic man's the most powerful creature in the universe tirade last time. Beast Boy can shrink. Yeah. Uh, what? <laughs> I mean, uh, my hi- my head is exploding. So, I mean, even <laughs> even McGann says like when she goes into the deep pressure of the water, she's like, oh, I'm I'm being crushed down by the pressure and like getting denser. Like you can picture that being denser. I don't see like she can control her density. So I'm like, okay, so she can control. She can become incorporeal. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, I know that in the com in the regular comics, normally John Jones can also increase his density. So there's always this question about like, okay, there's Bruce Banner and the Hulk. Where is Hulk getting all this mass? Right? <laughs> like when somebody shape changes from a you know 150 pound human into a into a, a one ton dinosaur, where is this mass coming from? So superhero science. That's where right. It it's superhero from. science usually. But now I'm like looking at I'm looking at Beast Boy and I'm like. I'm like, okay, you're turning into a gorilla and you're like a 13-year-old. Okay, I'm having to hand wave that a little bit, see what's going on with that, I guess. And you're shrinking down to like Bumble. You have Bumblebee's powers, basically. You can shrink down to at least a certain extent, maybe not atomic level or whatever, but like he can shrink. And where's that mask coming from? Or going, where's the mask coming from? Where's the mask going? But now that I'm looking at like thinking about her powers, I'm thinking like, okay, she can decrease her ma- like when she becomes incorporeal is she shifting her molecules between molecules like flash does or is she losing mass somehow and if she's if if Martian manhunter is increasing his density without changing his size that means he's increasing mass so where is all that coming from and then if he can control mass then that means that beast boy can do the same thing because he's got her powers, so that explains a little bit, at least that that's where his size thing's coming from. But I'm like really confused. <laughs> like I, it, I both have a better answer, quote unquote, because at least the answer, the at least the idea that if he turns into an elephant, like he's and he's that heavy, like he's standing on top of you know Green Beetle and crushing him down, like that mass has to come from somewhere. I don't know. I'm so fascinated. I know it's comic book know. logic, but. He can shrink. It's to me that's the that's the revelation. Like you had a, whatever in the couple of issues ago where you were talking about like she can turn into animals. Well, it makes perfect <laughs> sense because Beast Boy can. I don't know why we didn't think about that. It's just not something that she's skilled at. And I'm now I'm like, she wait, Beast Boy can do what? Do <laughs> like I guess he turns into birds and smaller yeah. birds and stuff. But like when he's shrinking down to like a tiny little bug for some reason, that's like beyond my line. I have no idea what's going on in my head. Um. And the second thing, I love Plastic Man being like the audience stand-in for what's happening to Barbara in yeah, that fight. It's wonderful. 
It's so wonderful. It's so he's got his face like smashed up against the, the force field at one point, and he's all got his like plastic man overly expressive shocked faces. <laughs> it's so great. It's great. I love Brainiac's comment about the irony of Blue Beetle helping to defend the planet because he was pretty much literally coming to save Metropolis because the planet was going to be destroyed <laughs> by Blue Beetle's people, which is interesting. Yep. But he says something about it, which means that Brainiac knew something about what, what might or may or may not be happening in the future. Brainiac, like, following his moral code was interesting to me. Like, yeah. wait. If you if you insist on me not taking the city, you're going to blow up your planet, which is me basically trying to avoid, trying to help. I'm trying to help by saving your culture because I know your planet will be destroyed is different than destroying your planet in trying to help it. And so somehow Brainiac gets talked out of it because of a moral code that makes sense to me. That's interesting because he's usually just yeah. cackling megalomaniacal Milton Fine or whatever, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I thought that was an, a really interesting and cool way of solving the problem. Same thing with Killstar almost, where he was like, look, a tyrant's taking over my planet. I need your help. But I just handle yeah. things in an alien way that doesn't make sense. And I guess I see what you're saying. And I guess I'll go do something, go do it differently, right? Yeah. Like it wasn't out of malice. He just genuinely did not interpret these people as right. people. Exactly. Like it had never crossed his mind. <laughs> right. That like, oh, they're alive. And then once he realizes, it's like, oh, I can't do that. Yeah, but his logic about it too, it's like, there are artificially intelligent weapons all over the universe. I don't understand why you're any different than that. Like, they still they still serve people. Like, you know, they serve people. I'm people. You're not people, right? That's what he's thinking. Like, you guys were made in this particular way, which I found uh, kind of cool and alien and interesting. I loved the comment where they were like, He's like, oh, maybe they, maybe they're messing with, maybe Brainiac was messing with us, or uh, Killstar was meth messing with us. If I can get that word out by taking, the, by knowing that we wanted to arrest the villains and having them not show up in the same place as us. And somebody's like, why would we want to arrest Grodd? And I'm like, oh right, because the Grodd from this universe is still just a super science ape in Africa who was actually working with the team not very long ago. Which I found interesting. And then you get to see the power of Grodd's mind where he's like, oh, no, I'm just you. These are not the villains you're looking for. You know, he's just like waving his hands and nobody can see them, including like Superman. And I'm like, oh, hello. That's wow. Grodd's powers are through the roof. And I just I just opened it. The one who says, why would we want to arrest Grodd is Miss Martian, who is the one who teamed up with. Right. Him. Exactly. Good point. So Yeah, that was interesting. Uh, and then, of course, Superman's like, wait a minute, collecting from worlds that were doomed, I should have asked him if he had something from Krypton, you know, referring again to that bottled, the bottled city of Kandor that we were talking about in previous, uh, previous uh, episodes. Um, I would be fascinated to see, because we don't get anything of Krypton, anything of Superman's origin. We don't even get, we get one shot of what, what in comic book showing of Lois Lane and one of Jimmy Olsen. So, like, I'd be interested to see if the Bottled City of Candor thing becomes a thing. Because, like, we know Connor has his Kryptonian name. We know right. this this issue even has, like, Clark insisting, has Superman insisting that, like, no, Connell is is a Kryptonian. He is. Right. He's not any less than I am. Right. And it's a whole thing. I'm like, I want it. I want to see Krypton. And we we know that he has a Fortress of Solitude, but it only shows up in Failsafe and they don't see the inside of it. Superman has a fortress solitude? of solitude. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's our No, you go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that's that's like some of my stuff like I I'm, I'm a lot of my views and, and and observations were paralleling yours um and then I just had a few of these other things so a lot of my comments were made earlier. And we I could I we could have a whole episode spe like a a super sweetheart special just breaking down Dick Grayson and his love like love life with the, with the, <laughs> With the two of us, me talking about the historical aspects of them. That may happen. We could do that. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. We still need content right. before season three. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll need to find like a, a like a, a, a relationship therapist to help us talk about Dick Grayson. <laughs> Invite them. <laughs> Is this boy okay? <laughs> <laughs> Invite them on the All show. Right. But, but uh, to wrap this up, to wrap up our last Feeling the Aster for our comics, I just want to point out that it is ridiculously sweet that the comics end with our final, like, 
the end tag for the final issue of this arc is just says never the end and this comic had come out after the final episode of the series had aired after it had been canceled all of that these came out and never the end will always be the sweetest tag they could have given this series to the point that it it became a hashtag for a while when they were campaigning to bring it back for a third season early on it's hashtag never the end hashtag heroes never die were the two going around uh, connected to a lot of online posts. And I love it. Yeah. And I love that they did that. And uh, I, I agree with you and, and ended up being beautifully prophetic as well. So, all right. Okay. Well, that wraps up our... Season three. That's right. Season three. All right. Let's hit in some artistic license. Have all four sidekicks ever been in the same place at the same time? Don't call us sidekicks. An artistic license will be recommending individual issues, miniseries, and graphic novel collections, both from DC and other companies who have titles we think Young Justice fans will enjoy. Artistic license is designed to give you an on-ramp into the classic story arcs of the past so that you might catch a glimpse of what's to come in the future. So for our final artistic license, we're recommending a little something that's a little more recent that I read pretty recently. That is Batgirl, the Batgirl 2016 series the Batgirl of Burnside is what a lot of people refer to it as. Volume 3, Summer of Lies. Uh, that is a really interesting little story that I picked up that's about Batgirl teaming up with Nightwing and facing a villain from their past that they ran into when they were both just young Batgirl and Robin and has a really nice little juxtaposition between that, fighting that enemy when they were younger and the resurfacing of that enemy now that they are both adults and does... At the same time that there's all this action and mystery and adventure of like, who are we fighting and who are they really has a wonderful little undertone of like the way their relationship has changed over the years and how they were just two teenagers in love. And now they are both single and not in a relationship and dealing with like the fact that they're still friends and the fact that their relationship is more complicated, but that they both completely trust each other. And it's nice. It was a nice little read from what I have read of it. And you you should all check it out if you feel so inclined to read about Barbara and Dick being being cute and fighting villains and having adventures and talking about their feelings sometimes. <laughs> right. And there is a there's a lot of different uh, dynamics and relationships between them that you can read. They dated in Batman the Animated Series um, for a little while and then something got kind of weird there toward the end. Um, <laughs> I don't know if we can get into that either. Whelmed after dark. Yeah, exactly. Whelmed after dark. Yeah, but there's some other ones as well, particularly after she became Oracle. Um, there was some really touching story arcs with them in it as well. So you can definitely read a lot of Bat Bat. That doesn't even work. Uh, I believe most people call it Dick Babs. Like just their both of their <laughs> shorter names mashed together. But you know. That's terrible. It's I know that's terrible. That's terrible. It's it's up to you. Call them, I I refer to them as Batgirl and Nightwing. <laughs> it's it's bat- easier. We can't and do we can't do were- Batwing either because that's actually a character. Yep. I believe the show. If I'm Nightgirl, no, that's a character too. Well, the show's got to call it Spin the Bottle, right? <laughs> right. Uh, that would have been adorable, <laughs> but no. What happens next? Had something. It had, what was it? It had a name and I'm forgetting it. Let's find that name because Dick Babs does not, does not sound kosher to me at all. Whoops. We named a character that was a totally normal name back in the 40s and then language evolved. Whoops. Yeah. Uh, Maneuver 7. People called them Maneuver 7, apparently, according to the YJ Wiki. I'm in. I'm in. Maneuver 7 works for me. <laughs> Because of the one scene in season two? Because of their, they have a couple of scenes where it's just like, I'm just going to toss my sometimes girlfriend through the air. <laughs> At the bad guys. And that's our <laughs> ship name. I love it. I love it. All right. Awesome. We'll go check those things out as well. Um, <laughs> go read about Batgirl and Nightwing. They're cute sometimes. <laughs> that's right. Um, we are also going to be making arrangements with um, Christopher Jones to come on and do uh, basically an overall run uh, from beginning to end of stuff that he worked on on Young Justice for whatever he can legally talk about. 
um, to join us as well as soon as we set that up. It may be a little bit, though, depending on all our three schedules. And with all that, uh, we can wrap up this uh, final comic commentary mission. Well, final for the moment. Never the end. Hashtag never the end. Never the end. And head out of the Watchtower. The best way to support the show is to share it with a friend. You can also support us with a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. Leaving a rating or review pushes us up in the search ranks and helps other people find the show. Please continue to hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology. Even though we've wrapped up our things, supporting the comics is the best way to show DC that we would read more comics if they would make them. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, and remember to buy the show somewhere online until that DC streaming service launches, hopefully soon. <laughs> You can also now use hashtag Young Justice Outsiders when talking about season three. And if you want to help us get more episodes, more secret origins, more actual play podcasts, and more of everything else that we do, please consider supporting us through Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you can help us do even more with the show while getting some great rewards for yourself. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well.